great on the chalkboard, but without the right personnel, it'll never be of much use. Yes, for all of football's X's and O's, sometimes a game simply breaks down to one thing. My guy can beat your guy. Perhaps that's why San Diego's Air Coriel offense was such a success back in the 1980s. The system asked for a quarterback to throw to a spot on the field off a two- or three-step drop, and few were better at it than Dan Fouts. Plus, Fouts had a bevy of all-pro targets to choose from in Kellen Winslow and Charlie Joyner and John Jefferson behind this high-octane attack. The Chargers advanced to the AFC Championship game in 1980, hosting their hated division rivals, the Oakland Raiders. On that Sunday, San Diego's scheme and its stars would be tested like never before. It did not take long to realize that this was not to be a typical San Diego Sunday. When fans are this frenzied and players this resolute, it can mean but one thing. This is a championship game. Charger quarterback Dan Fouts fired for over 4,700 yards this season. And Louis Kelcher and his fellow Bruise brothers led the league with 60 sacks. Their opponent in this AFC title game, the surprising Oakland Raiders, led by the resurrected Jim Plunkett. After a decade of service, this game will be by far Plunkett's most important since he left Stanford 10 years ago. Another reason for Oakland's presence in this championship has been the play of the Raider defense led by miracle man Lester Hayes, who paced the NFL with 13 interceptions. Hayes and his fellow Raider defenders will have their work cut out for them if they hope to stop John Jefferson and Don Coryell's devastating air attack. From sunny San Diego, it's the Oakland Raiders versus the San Diego Chargers in the AFC Championship game. The winner earns an invitation to Super Bowl 15 in New Orleans. The loser joins the 90 million who will watch on television. Lightning bolts cracking the sky have been commonplace in San Diego this season. The Chargers strike quickly and often here through the air. This game would begin with a 65-yard touchdown pass, not by the rifle arm of Dan Fouts, but by the rejuvenated wrist of Jim Plunkett. Folks have said that some lucky bounces this year got the Raiders here. It was time now for a very fortunate deflected pass. Raymond Chester outraced everyone with the ball that first touched the hands of Kenny King. Today's rules state that the ball may touch two offensive players in succession. A few years ago, the score would have been disallowed. History is history. And Chester's alert reception meant a 7 to nothing Raider lead. Charger fans rarely panic, for they know that Air Coriel is a great way to fly. The Chargers don't take the bus. They fly the SST and advance quickly through the air. On the first play from scrimmage, Bouts did just that. Sure, the element of surprise made the 55-yard gain possible, but so did a nifty play fake to Chuck Muncie, number 46, that froze the Raider defense, allowing Ron Smith to free himself down the sideline. Smith's reception gave San Diego a first down at the Raider 28. Passing got them there, so Fouts threw once more. catches over the middle made John Jefferson an all-pro this season. But another all-pro, Lester Hayes, would make a statement to the Chargers. That statement, if you live by the pass, you can die by it as well. Amazingly, Hayes' interception was his fifth in the last five games. The Chargers were halted, but the Raiders failed to capitalize, so Dan Fouts continued to ply his craft, with nine minutes remaining in the opening championship quarter. Charlie Joyner, one of three Chargers to amass over 1,000 in reception yardage, got the Chargers moving. 
The next time Fouts hit Joyner, it tied this all-important playoff game. Joyner's reception was indeed a piece of pass-catching wizardry. He actually picked the ball blindly off the top of his own helmet in the midst of double coverage on the way to the turf. Another look reveals that Joyner's concentration and his uncanny sixth sense allow the Chargers to quickly tie the game. A generally immobile Dan Fouts skillfully evaded the rush, and veteran Joyner did the rest. Joyner is the forgotten man in the Charger attack due to the publicity given superstars John Jefferson and Kellen Winslow. Perhaps this catch will make him a bit more recognized. One of the forgotten men in the game over the last five years has been Jim Plunkett. People said he couldn't throw long anymore. Jim knew better. Plunkett and speedster Cliff Branch joined their talents for a 48-yard gain, and Oakland moved towards the lead. Others said that Plunkett was a sitting duck in the pocket, and his knees were too battered to support him. Once again, the 32-year-old knew better. Plunkett's gutsy run put the Raiders up 14-7 midway through the first quarter. A quarter that so far had seen three touchdowns tallied in under eight minutes of play. There was time for a fourth touchdown in the opening 15 minutes, and receiver Bob Chandler had Oakland advancing towards a two-touchdown lead. Chandler took advantage of some rather lazy coverage, and Plunkett next sought out his tight end, Ray Chester, who caught the game's first scoring toss. Veterans Bob Chandler and Ray Chester joined with 10-year man Plunkett to sweep the Raiders downfield. Youngster Kenny King joined in with a senior threesome for black and silver touchdown number three. King's catch put the Raiders ahead by a pair of touchdowns with less than two minutes remaining in a seemingly endless, wide-open quarter of football. On the last play of the quarter, Fouts set out to play a little catch-up. Joyner's catch made him the reception leader in the first half with four catches for 88 yards. Air Coriel was back in action. But the next time Fouts and his band of flyboys were cleared for takeoff, the skies were well patrolled. Quarterback Otis McKinney was the air traffic controller responsible for grounding Kellen Winslow and the Chargers. His interception was nullified when the referee whistled Oakland offsides. Fouts had new life, and J.J. was ready. Had Jefferson caught the ball cleanly, he'd have been off to the races. But perhaps he bobbled the ball for an instant because he couldn't believe who had just thrown such a rocket. Not Fouts, but multi-talented Kellen Winslow. Jefferson had to settle for a big gain instead of a sure score. His slight miscalculation proved costly three plays later. New York Jet Burgess Owens picked off Fouts' second errant toss of the half. The Raiders again could not convert the turnover into points, but when Mike Thomas coughed up the ball for the Chargers' third championship mistake, the Raiders took advantage. 
All-Pro Ted Hendricks made the alert recovery on the Charger 25, and after a costly holding penalty, Cliff Branch made a clutch catch and exhibited some nifty first down securing moves. With a first and goal, Mark Van Egan blew through one of the largest openings in football history. Van Egan's run made it 28-7 Raiders. The game had become a blowout and perhaps the expression of Charger defensive end Louis Kelcher portrayed best the feeling in the city of San Diego. Oakland's defense, led by all-pro linebacker Ted Hendricks, knew, however, that even a three-touchdown lead is not always enough against San Diego's explosive offense. Dan Fouts began to substantiate such fears with a completion to Mike Thomas, number 22. Fouts engineered a tidy 13-play drive with balanced running and passing, capping it off with his second touchdown toss of the day to Charlie Joyner. NFL's oldest receiver at 32, Joyner is still the man the Chargers go to in clutch situations. He did not disappoint here as San Diego got a vital score to make it 28 to 14. A replay shows that Fouts just did get the pass off before Hendricks, number 83, barged into the pocket. Just a minute to go in the half, the Chargers stopped the Raiders, giving San Diego one last chance to score. Fouts looked for Jefferson, but cornerback Dwayne Osteen, number 35, kept J.J. from doing any damage. had been a shocking and disappointing half for Jefferson and the Chargers as the Raiders had controlled the tempo almost throughout. With only a 14-point differential, the game was still up for grabs, but only if San Diego would curb their mistakes and play their game. Such a task would not be easy, and they knew it. Oakland continued to play aggressively as the third quarter began with this apparent heist by cornerback Dwayne Osteen. San Diego ended up with the ball after the fumble, but it mattered not. Osteen was guilty of pass interference, and the Chargers began with a clean slate. Once again, Dan Fouts looked at Charlie Joyner, and the ageless All-Pro was there to lend a hand. But then began a series of plays that changed the course of the game. Fouts spotted Jefferson alone in the end zone, but then J.J. did a very un-Jefferson-like thing. Undaunted, Fouts went right back to the goggle-eyed receiver on the very next play. But Jefferson, who has spoiled everyone with impossible catches throughout his career, could not make the one that would have cut the Oakland lead to a touchdown.
Once more, it was Osteen on the scene, preventing J.J. from making the big play. The Chargers were forced to settle for a Rolf Bernerschka field goal, making it 28 to 17, Oakland. The Charger defense stopped the Raiders on the next series, however, and a new drive was sparked with a solid punt return from Mike Fuller, number 42. It was the first time the Chargers had been able to offer any rebuttal to Ray Guy's booming punts. San Diego then kept things moving as bouts went back to Mike Thomas in the flat for his fifth catch of the day. was doing yeoman's work subbing for Chuck Muncy who had left the game earlier with a shoulder bruise. But when San Diego got inside the Oakland 10-yard line, Muncy reappeared, much to the dismay of the Raiders. The Chargers, once 21 points behind, now trail by just four. A second look shows that it was Muncy's surprising outside speed, plus a sturdy escort from pulling guard Doug Wilkerson, number 63, that provided the necessary ingredients for the San Diego touchdown. The tide had definitely turned. The Charger faithful could feel it as they rocked Jack Murphy Stadium with their cheers. The once enormous lead was now almost gone, and Oakland knew it would have to do something quickly to regain control of the situation. The man who sparked the Raiders' revival was a familiar name, running back Kenny King. King picked up 22 important yards on the reception, then served as the decoy in a play-action fake on the next play. A toss to tight end Raymond Chester. The game set up a field goal by Chris Barr, making it 31 to 24 Oakland. And soon after, the Raiders were on the march again. This time it was fullback Mark Van Egan with one of his patented runs up the middle. Then it was time for Plunkett to do some scampering on his own. The usually immobile quarterback showed he could avoid trouble and did so before spotting wide receiver Bob Chandler, number 85. Shortly after this completion, the Raiders tacked on another field goal and were breathing a bit easier, 34 to 24. There was still plenty of time left in the game, but San Diego would have to move quickly. Number 80, Kellen Winslow, got things off to a good start. Then it was Muncie, bruised shoulder and all, trying the outside of a Raider defense now geared to stop the pass on almost every play. The Chargers once more were halted short of a touchdown and settled for three points. The score was now 34 to 27, and the San Diego defense knew it had to get the ball back. Less than seven minutes remained, and the one thing they could not permit was a time-consuming Raider drive.
Just when it seemed that the Chargers had stopped Oakland, 10-year veteran Wilbur Young, number 99, made a costly error, jumping off sides on third and long. The mistake enabled Oakland to keep their march going. And when Plunkett escaped trouble and made a crucial first down, it was all over for San Diego. The final result was a bitter pill for the potent Chargers to swallow. They had been favored to win, but despite their many strengths, they could not pull it off. They would be able to look back upon several mistakes and squandered opportunities that had brought on the final result. But they would also have to credit their bitter Raider rivals. Oakland had won four of their last five games on the road just to qualify for the playoffs and get this far. Now one more road game remains. But the Raiders are thrilled over the prospect. For that game is in the New Orleans Superdome. That game is against the Philadelphia Eagles for the World Championship. That game is the Super Bowl. Two weeks later, Oakland defeated the Eagles 27 to 10 in Super Bowl 15, and quarterback Jim Plunkett was named the game's most valuable player. San Diego's Dan Fouts never did play in the big game losing the 1981 AFC Championship game to the Cincinnati Bengals a year later. Still, Dan Fout's legacy as a prolific passer earned him a bust in the Hall of Fame, where he's joined by Kellen Winslow and Charlie Joyner. The third member of the Air Coriel receiver trio, John Jefferson, traded to Green Bay in 1981 and replaced by Wes Chandler. This memorable... <laughs>